But I do just want to, the entire, our entire presentation is around protecting water. So what I have definitely noticed about the average Minnesotan, and I would say most Minnesotans, is that we have a very strong connection to water. So many Minnesotans drink groundwater, unless you live in a major metropolitan area, uh, you're very likely drinking groundwater. Um, and then all of us have, or almost all of us, have our favorite lake, river, stream that we recreate on. And we always have to remember that all of our water is connected. So we're going to really focus on tonight about how having a good well and a, and, a, and a good septic system is the best thing that we can do as property owners to protect our ground and um, surface water. So I do, again, just want to highlight that the funding for this program primarily came from the Department of Health. Um, there's a little bit of funding that comes from the university as well because we are also training septic professionals on some of the topics that we're going to touch on tonight through our other training program. So what we are going to discuss tonight is what are chemicals of emerging concern and that's kind of the new topic that isn't necessarily wells and septics although it's connected to both of those but just to introduce this idea that there are new contaminants out there that are a threat to our ground and surface waters. But we're going to spend most of our time talking about what a good septic system is and what a good drinking water system is and what you can do as a property owner to protect that. The fact sheet that you see on the right side of this picture um, is on our website. You can see the link, but if you just go to the main, our main website, septic.umn.edu, there's actually a ton of information for homeowners on that page and on the training event page we have this document which I call like kind of the cliff notes um, of tonight. So, so the first topic I mentioned is what are chemicals of emerging concern. So when you look at this picture in front of you it kind of highlights some of these new contaminants that we are identifying in our water. So it's things like prescription drugs, scents, dyes, you see that couch down there, you may wonder why would a couch be a new contaminant? Well, it's not the couch, right? It's the potential flame retardants that are put on furniture, right? So you see an enamel pan there that may have a coating on it that could get down into, um, into our pipes, right? Through our wastewater system. And the question is, where are some of those contaminants going? So most of us know when we hear the word contaminant, what it means, right? It's a substance, somewhere where it doesn't belong. But these chemicals of emerging concern, or I'm going to call them CECs, are substances that we have, that have been released to, found in, or have the potential to enter our waters here in Minnesota, across the country, and across the world. One of the challenges for some of these newer contaminants we're finding is they do not have a human health-based guidance value. And what I mean by that is many of us have heard of nitrate, for instance, right? There's a federal health risk limit for nitrate, which Jeff is going to spend a lot more time talking about. It's 10 milligrams per liter. Well, so with, with some of these other contaminants, we don't have that value established of what, what, what levels are really um, safe for us or maybe aquatic species that are living in, in those waters. So some of these contaminants we know have a, a risk or a perceived risk. And there's always new information that we're getting every day. So it may be down the road that with some of these contaminants we do have a health risk limit, but we don't have one yet today. So you see these can include pharmaceuticals, pesticides, industrial um, effluents, personal care products, and certainly the ones we control are the things that we would be using in our homes. That, um, that we are, again, putting down the drain through our, through, um, out to our septic system. So we are finding new contaminants in our waters. And I believe that the number one reason is many of these contaminants aren't necessarily brand new chemicals, right? Flame retardants have been around, but we have new methods to find things at pretty low levels. So typical contaminants, like I mentioned, nitrate, we measure again in parts per million. That's what milligrams per liter is. We are now measuring things at parts per trillion. But if I asked you how much atrazine you wanted in your drinking water, what would you say? I kind of want to say none, right? Zero. That's what I want. I don't say, oh, I'm okay with 0 0.0001, right? Or, you know, something to the, to the, to the, degree, right? So 
Um, that's kind of one of the challenges is that we are looking for new substances. We're looking them for at lower levels. We have new substances that are being used and old substances that are being used in new ways. So here again, kind of shows some of the things that could be going down the drain at our house that fall into this group of CECs, right? Antibiotics, hormones, metab metabolites, psychoactive drugs, lipid regulators, pain relievers, um, the fire retardants, our cleaning products. So these all have the risk of what then happens once they go down the drain, right? So is our septic system um, removing them all? So this picture shows, again, a typical septic system, which we're going to talk more about, right? The CECs are leaving the home, and we know almost every home is going to put out low levels of some of these CECs. They're going to travel through the tank, and then they're going to go out to that drain field area. And so the question then is, are those CECs being fully degraded and or absorbed in our soil treatment system? And I would say this is the area where we're gathering more information, that we have ongoing research here actually in Minnesota looking at this issue. But we always also have to remind that we are talking about very low levels generally leaving people's homes and that the soil actually does have a tremendous potential to break down contaminants. It may not be perfect though, and that's why we're continuing to look at this issue. But what I can tell you is if you have a good septic system, which we'll talk more about, that increases the likelihood that you are treating all the contaminants in the wastewater, including uh, CECs. So what is a good septic system? Well, a septic system should not back up into your home. And I think that's pretty obvious to all of us. But I will tell you the system I grew up with, and again, now we're talking about 40 plus years ago, um, we knew when to get our tank pumped because our laundry water would show up in the basement, right? That was time for the tank to be pumped. That is not a properly operating septic system. That was a problematic septic system. I didn't know that when I was a kid, right? Um, your system should never surface. And this could be as obvious as a pipe in your yard, but for some people, this means that their drain field area or downgrading of their mound is very spongy and wet a lot of the time, not just after rainfall events. Um, so those are pretty obvious examples of when your, se your septic system could be causing people to come in contact with untreated sewage. These other two are a little harder to see, but they're definitely, oh, my slides aren't moving. Hmm. Let me see. Okay, just a second. It mustn't be showing you guys the right screen. Hmm. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Then I'm going to share again and see if I pick a different screen. Screen two. I'm going to shift, try that one. Share. It's still, you, you guys still can't. Can you see a slide that says components of a septic system? I need someone to, no, Larry's nodding for me, no, so. No, I can't, Sarah, this is Jeff, okay. I can't see the, just the first slide is all it's showing. Okay, I need to, it's a problem of, I work from, I'm working from home, right, and I have so um, many uh, screens. Do you see that, components of a septic system now? Yep, that, that looks good. Yay, sorry about that. I was going through slides, believe it or not. <laughs> all right. So hopefully that made some sense. But uh, again, getting into this is where I have actually more pictures that are relevant. So, so again, here's a typical septic system. And this may not, again, be exactly what look, the one in your backyard looks like. But we start with the house, right? And the house and what you put down the drain are very important. And we will talk more about this later. But the source, and if you're lucky, it actually then flows by gravity out of your house into your septic tank. Your septic tank is primary treatment, meaning this is where the treatment process starts, and then where a majority of the actual then final treatment and dispersal of that water back into the environment happens out in the soil treatment system. So a couple other things I just wanna highlight at the bottom of this picture, you'll see in that right corner, the three foot separation to the limiting conditions. So that is uh, the state code requirement about how much good dry soil you need to make sure 
we're removing all of the bad stuff that's in sewage before it gets to a limiting condition. And so the two limiting conditions we design for are saturated soil or bedrock, both which will not adequately treat wastewater. So a little bit more about that septic tank that we all have. Its primary job is to settle things out. So heavier solids are going to settle to the bottom of the tank and some lighter materials like oils and greases will float to the top. So it is very important that your septic tank be working properly because if you don't, if it's not properly maintained, if it's not properly settling, you can overload your soil treatment system which would cause it to prematurely fail. So you'll also see it's going to do that storage, but it's also going to have special bacteria, special to me because they're willing to live in a septic tank, right? They're actually called anaerobic bacteria because that tank does not have oxygen. There's no way to get air into it. That's how they're designed. So the bacteria living in that tank will continue the digestion process that actually started in our guts, right? There's lots of bacteria in our gut. They go out to the septic tank. They continue to digest that food. So, um, the, and kind of looking at the three layers, right? So the scum, the lighter stuff that floats to the top, the sludge on the bottom, and then the, the layer in the middle is a cleaner effluent. So looking at a few other things about this tank that are important. The wastewater comes from the house, right on the left where you see inlet. Um, and right as it comes in, there's something called a baffle. The purpose of this baffle is to make sure that as the wastewater comes in, it has a good amount of detention. So these septic tanks are designed to have two to three days of detention time, plus they have to store sludge and scum because you don't want to pump it you know, every two weeks, right? We want to have a long interval between pumping, so they're designed to store some of that sludge and scum between pumping. You'll also notice there's typically going to be the same baffle on the way out, and this one is even more important than the one on the way in because it makes sure that the scum layer floating on the top doesn't go out to the drain field. Some newer systems also may have what you see here on the end, which is an effluent screen. Uh, it's an additional filtering device to make sure uh, lar any larger solids that didn't settle out are caught by the screen. Um, if you have an older system, you certainly don't have uh, one of these. And it's not required in all new systems, but it's a really good, inexpensive add-on, but it does need maintenance. So getting on to maintenance, that's what you'll notice also about this picture, is this picture shows what I would say is a more modern septic tank, and what I mean by that is it has two manholes to grade. So a lot of older tanks only have one manhole in the center, and the reason why we went to two was both those baffles are potential locations that we may need to do service, and it's a lot easier to do service when you have a large diameter access. The other reason this is a more modern septic tank is you'll notice that those manhole lids are to grade, and that also is to facilitate maintenance. Some older systems, you may only see a four or typically six inch inspection pipe coming to the surface, and a really older system, you may not see anything. Uh, but um, it, it just makes the system a lot easier to maintain when, it's, when those manholes are at the surface. So I just wanted to show you what some of those real effluent screens look like or effluent filters. Um, they are definitely becoming more common. These are proprietary devices installed on the outlet of the tank, as I mentioned, designed to remove additional solids. Um, so they're a great addition to the system, but they do need to be inspected and cleaned regularly, so access is critical. So these, again, are typically located um, under a manhole for that purpose. So moving on to the soil treatment system. So um, many people in Minnesota still today do get an in-ground system. Sometimes people call these trenches or beds or drain fields or leach fields. They're called all kinds of different things. But in-ground trench systems are still allowed in our state if you have the right soil conditions. But the key thing is, is that from where the sewage enters the soil, you need to have three feet of dry soil. So that means on your property you would need to have at least four, right? Because these things are put into the ground. So that's before that limiting condition. So these are typically installed as gravity systems, meaning they don't have a pump in them. Um, but on many properties in Minnesota, we do not have that um, existing three feet of dry soil. So all a mound system is, is an elevated drain field. 
where we bring in sand uh, to meet that separation requirement. So here's a question for you all. So what percentage of homes in Minnesota do you think are served with septic systems? So I'm not going to ask you to type in. You can if you want in the chat box. But um, interestingly, uh, a new annual report came out in Minnesota, and the answer to this actually went up. We'd often said it was around that 25%, but according to the latest data we have, it's about 32% of single-family homes in Minnesota are served with a septic system. So I like to say that's 33%. Right, because that's then it's like one in three homes in Minnesota has a septic system. So that is another reason why it's really important that people have good systems and properly take care of them because that's a lot of wastewater on an annual basis. So what are we worried about in wastewater? There's all kinds of stuff, right? Ironically, the wastewater that comes out of our homes is 99% water. But that 1% is really important that we deal with adequately. So the number one thing we need to deal with is pathogens. So these are the things that make us sick, viruses and bacteria. There are also solids that our systems need to deal with, both organic and inorganic. There's nutrients. The two biggest ones we're concerned about here in Minnesota are phosphorus and nitrogen. But there are other um, micronutrients in lower amounts. And finally, there's chemicals that are going into the system. So cleaning products from our water softeners, medications. And I just want to highlight on this picture on the right, uh, we see uh, black water and gray water. So I just want to talk about that terminology a little bit. You can see typically black water is the water that comes from our toilet, which is more concentrated. It is where the heaviest load from our homes comes. But keep in mind, the gray water coming from our house still needs to be treated. You know, I like to think about, there's a reason why we wash our clothes, right? Because they're dirty. Like laundry water has vi viruses and bacteria in it. It has soaps in it, right? It has solids in it. And that's true of all the gray water in our home. So it is very important that all of the contaminated water in our system go out to the drain field. So where are we dealing with these? Are we dealing with them in the tank? Are we dealing them with out in the soil treatment system? And the answer is both, right? So we'll get a little bit more into the details here. But what we're trying to make sure is that as this plume of water moves away from the septic system up gradient, we want to make sure that it will be safe for other people to use that water. So most of you sitting at home right now uh, are drinking some sort of beverage, right? Since it's night, maybe some of you are having a beer, maybe it's water, tea, whatever it might be. Most of that's water, right? And so what I like to think about is the water that, you know, you're drinking, has it ever been used before? And the answer to me is absolutely. Um, I think some people like to think they're drinking dinosaur pee that's recycled, right? That it's really old. Most of our groundwater isn't that old. We're, we're drinking water. And it really depends on your aquifer and how deep your wells are. But that water has been used before. So you have to think about with your septic system or next time you flush the toilet, that someone's gonna to need to use that water again. So that's what we wanna make sure our septic systems do. So how, again, do they deal with pathogens? Um, so these pathogens are the things that make us sick. Again, viruses, bacteria, worms, and protozoa. They do impact human health if you come in contact with those. The interesting thing is most of these harmful bacteria and viruses, they were living inside our body, right? We shed them primarily through our intestinal tract. They are used to being in an anaerobic environment. That's what our guts are. They actually do not deal well or live well in an oxygen-rich environment. That's why we designed for three feet of unsaturated soil. So the soil, not the septic tank, is where the viruses and bacteria are treated. So moving on to the organic solids, so these again are digested and undigested animal and vegetable material. So again, thinking about food that we either ate or is partially digested through our system. It also can include synthetic organic compounds. If these reach a water body, they will take oxygen to break down. So the actual lab terminology, we can actually measure how much organic waste is in the system by measuring the BOD. 
And that value isn't important. What is important is that if this reaches a lake river stream, it reduces the dissolved oxygen that's available to the aquatic species living in that water. <clears throat> So how we deal with these in a septic system is some of them will be stored in the sludge layer and be removed when the system is pumped. If you have an effluent screen or a filter, that will help hold more of these solids back. But some of this organic material will actually serve as a food source for the good bacteria that live out in the drain field. When you start putting sewage out to the soil, what happens is the natural soil microbes that live in the soil come to eat that food. As long as it's at like acceptable levels, which means not too high, normal domestic wastewater, the, so the soil microbes are able to keep up with the amount of food that's put out to the system. Unfortunately, some of the solids that we put down the drain are not um, organic, they are inorganic. Um, so inorganic examples could be, again, fibers from synthetic clothing, which could be lint from your washing machine as an example, minerals and metals and salts, right, can be part of our systems from plumbing and makeup and things along those lines. So unfortunately, these inorganic solids are not able to be broken down by the bacteria in the septic tank or out in the soil. So they have the risk of plugging the soil pores. So we really do, this is why again, it's so important that the septic tank be working because we do want these to settle out as much as possible. And again, here's another example where the screen can really help us. But this could be a reason why eventually septic systems fail. So I happened to talk to a lady right before our, our, our meeting tonight who had a 40 year old drain field, right, that had reached the end of its life. And she wanted to know, you know, what did I do wrong? You know, 40 years is a, is a good life for a system. I mean, think about how many things you have around your house. Is your refrigerator 40 years old? Is your roof 40 years old? Septic systems do have a life expectancy, and usually we say 25 to 30 years is typical. That doesn't mean everyone lasts that long, and there are many people who will last well beyond that, because it really also depends how well you take care of your system, how you use your system. Kind of like driving a car. It's hard to ask, how long will this car last? Well. Depends how many miles you put on it, right? It depends if you do your maintenance. So moving on to the two big nutrients, phosphorus is a nutrient that primarily comes from us. We eat food that has phosphorus in it. It primarily is excreted in our urine. If you're putting food down the drain that isn't digested, that also has phosphorus. And there are a few household detergents that still use phosphoric acid as a soap. Unfortunately, you'll see, like in this picture, that a little bit of phosphorus can grow a lot of algae. So our aquatic systems here in the Midwest and in Minnesota, our lakes, how much algae or weeds they grow is based on how much phosphorus is available to feed them. The good news for septic systems is phosphorus has an affinity to stick to the soil if it's dry. So we designed for that three feet of unsaturated soil. That's also very beneficial because as the phosphorus moves through the soil, it basically sticks to the soil surface. So our septic systems are excellent phosphorus removal mechanisms if they're, if they're good systems. Nitrogen is a little different. So nitrogen is a nutrient too that is excreted in our urine and is in our food. It's also in some household cleaners, right? The most obvious one is ammonia. Ammonia-based cleaners are a form of nitrogen. So here in the Midwest, again, our number one concern with nitrogen and wastewater is it impacting our drinking water quality. So this is, again, that nitrate value we talked about earlier. If you lived in a coastal area, meaning, right, the ocean was your backyard instead of a lake, um, the growth of algae, like those red tides in Florida, if you've heard about those, that is based on nitrogen because ocean, the ocean environment is a nitrogen-limiting environment where we're a phosphorus one. So why I said this is a little different is not all septic systems do a good job at removing nitrogen. Um, some do better than others. Generally speaking, mounds remove a much higher percentage of the nitrogen in wastewater uh, than in-ground trench systems do. It is also the primary reason why we have well setbacks is to allow for some groundwater dilution with the goal of making sure that when we reach a down gradient well, we are below that 10 milligrams per liter. But that isn't always enough. There are sites and systems that will need advanced treatment. 
And uh, so like one example would be if you know the city of Acton, it's uh, not too far from uh, downtown Twin Cities metropolitan area. It's a bit, you know, relatively small downtown, but they recently um, had to install a system for that downtown. And it was designed for around 50,000 gallons of wastewater a day. Um, that system again was required to put in a system that would meet 10 milligrams per liter before it went into the soil. And the number one reason is to make sure that's a lot of water every day going into the soil, that if there was anyone downgrading of that system, that we would know that we were below that 10 milligrams per liter. So the last topic I just want to uh, touch on is how do we deal with the chemicals in our systems? Do keep in mind septic systems are designed to handle normal amounts of, of uh, chemicals, cleaners, medicines, they are not designed to handle ha hazardous waste. In large amounts, they have the risk of impacting your septic system. And that gets to be a hard thing in that we don't have the benefit of dilution, right? If you live in the city, for example, and you need to go on chemotherapy, do you think the wastewater treatment plant knows that your chemotherapy waste is reaching them? No, because there's a whole bunch of other people using the system. So by the time it gets to them, they can't tell, right? But if you're on a septic system, it may be you and maybe your, your husband or wife, right? Maybe you have a kid or two living with you, maybe not. There just isn't that benefit of dilution. So that's why it can harm your septic system if used in large amounts. And later when I come back and talk more about management and maintenance, we'll talk about some examples of what you can do to reduce the amount of cleaners uh, that are going into your system. Because the problem is, is we have evidence of it affecting our aquatic uh, food chain, species reproduction in particular, and we have found these contaminants that I talked about in the beginning in our drinking water, right? So I mentioned arsenic. So there was again, again a study that showed that there's actually people's tap water in cities that has very low levels of detectable arsenic, or not arsenic, sorry, atrazine. Arsenic is a different issue that Jeff will talk about coming up here. So, um, so we want to do everything we can to reduce the amount of that that's going out to the environment uh, to, to reduce that risk of it getting into our drinking water. So how they're treated again, some of them could be stored in the septic tank and we do see variable removal in the septic tank and the soil treatment system. And this is the other area I mentioned that we're gathering more data about. So again, that was kind of an overview of how septic systems work. I'm going to hand it over to Jeff now, who's going to talk about drinking water systems. And then I'm gonna come back for the exciting part of this presentation at the end to talk about maintenance and management in your home and what you can do to lengthen the life of your septic system. I am having problems sharing my screen here and all. If you want, I can, if you can't get it, I can share mine and just advance them for today. But I don't, I think I'm missing one of your slides, but we'll. That's all right. Um, it was right there, so. If you do have the slides, that'd be great. And you can just advance them if you can. Okay, now I just have to pick the right screen again. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. <laughs> Does it, you see what is a good drinking water system? I do. Um, your okay. video is covering a little bit of the screen. If you cut your video, can you, will it go away? I don't have my video. Um, if you see those thumbnails, I don't know if anyone else has this issue. There's a picture of like, who the attendees are, you can move that or minimize it. Hide thumbnail video if you don't want that showing. Because okay. it's not on my screen right now. I don't know if it's still okay. on yours. But. All right, well, we'll get going here. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming and stopping by and, uh, and uh, spending some time with us tonight. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to move on to the next slide.
So today's topics, we're going to talk about well construction, what a typical well looks like, groundwater protection, what you can do to protect your well's water quality, and water testing. Um, this is a picture of your typical um, uh, well, new well construction. It has a steel casing coming out of the ground. It, the casing extends about a foot out of the ground. It has a uh, rubber gasketed cap on top of there. And it has a well identification tag on there with a unique well number on there. It's a six digit number. If you have that number, we can pretty much look up any information that we do have on the well. And, um, and that's very useful to, it makes it very easy to look up the information on the well. Next. This is a picture of a more older well. It, it's, it has a jet pump with, with a two pipe jet on it. It, uh, or a single pipe jet, I guess this one is. And uh, it could be present in your basement. It could be in a basement offset or, or a well house out in your yard or even a well pit. It's kind of an older setup. And um, it, we often see these on the older, older wells that we go in to look at. Next, please. This is a picture of a either a dug well or a well in a pit. Both dug wells and wells and pits are susceptible to contamination. Uh, dug wells typically have very shallow surface watertight casing and they allow water to move in from the sides of the well and in through the bottom. Water seeps in and that's what re replenishes the water in the well. So they are very susceptible to, to contamination. Also, if a well is in a pit, depending on where the location is, it is susceptible to flooding and you can get flooding in some wells and pits. So we no longer allow dug wells like this or wells that are in pits. Um, they all have to be up to current code. Next, please. The three most common types of, of uh, well construction methods are mud rotary, air rotary, and cable tool, with mud rotary being the most common. Next. This is a picture of your typical, of your typical what you'd see under the ground. If you can picture the house being on top of the ground and the green area is your lawn. And then the bottom half of the slide is uh, the geology below the ground surface. The brown portion is a, maybe a dry sand or a contaminated sand that you don't want to make a well in. The, upper gray layer is a clay confining layer that will uh, stop water from moving downward into the blue colored aquifer. And the, the aquifer is a place where you're going to set your well placement. The well screen is going to go in there and you're going to be able to access the water out of there. And um, the bot very bottom layer is uh, if you drill deep enough, you get into the bedrock layer. So when a person comes out, well driller comes out, well, he'll drive his pretty big rig out in your yard. He'll set up, he'll drill down into the aquifer, and then he'll make the well. Next slide, please. That was pretty quick, so let's take a closer look at that. Um, again, we're looking at the geology below the ground. The contractors are gonna move that, advance that drill stem into the ground, into the water bearing formation. He's gonna recirculate his drilling fluid. It's coming, going down the inside of that pipe, drill stem, and then coming around the outside and taking cuttings from the hole. Next, please. And after they're done, they'll remove the drill stem. And uh, next, they will insert uh, the well screen, which is on the bottom of the well and the well casing into the, ground, into the hole. And um, next, please. And they'll back flush it with clean water and they'll add some gravel pack around the screen to work as a filter to keep out uh, solids and different fine materials that have been deposited drilling during the drilling process. And they're also present in the naturally occurring in the aquifer. Next. The next process would be to install a seal on top of that, well, that uh, gravel pack to, to keep other things out of the gravel, out of the um, packed area. Next, please. Next thing that'll happen, the pipe will be inserted along the outside of it and they'll use that to put, pump in sealing material. Next slide. The sealing material will gradually fill up that hole and it'll seal it between 
The outer borehole wall is about a seven or eight inch hole and the inner pipe's typically a four inch diameter casing. So you have what we call as an annular space around that well. And if, it, if you don't seal it up with something, you're gonna run the risk of having surface water run inside of your well alongside the casing and down into the aquifer and you get into your well. Next, please. This, this is, um, or after the well placement is in place, the screen is in place, they'll use compressed air and water and they'll, and they'll flush out the screen. It's called well development or screen development. And um, it will remove the fine material that's present in the, um, it will remove the fine material that's present in the uh, aquifer. And uh, so you can get a lot of production out of the well and it also prevent uh, silt and sediment from entering into the well too. Next, please. Some of you down in Redwood County might have wells in rock. Uh, typically, my understanding is there's not a lot of them if there are, but if there would be the, the uh, casing is advanced to the top of the rock, it gets sealed in place with a neat cement, and then they drill open hole down below it, and then water comes into the well through the fractures and the cracks and crevices in the bedrock formation. Bedrock formation also asks, works as a reservoir to, uh, to, so that you have some adequate storage because typically these rock wells don't produce a lot of water at any given time. Next, please. So talk a little bit about groundwater. Groundwater is uh, water that is contained in soil or rock or bedrock. Um, an aquifer is, is a solid or a rock that stores, it is able to transmit water. And a clay confining unit is soil or rock that restricts water movement. This is a picture of the hydrologic cycle. Um, typically, um, uh, the uh, rainfall and the snowfall fall to the ground like everybody realizes during the seasons. And what you can see is you can see the runoff from the hillsides into the lakes and rivers and streams. Part of it that you don't see is the water that runs, uh, filters into the ground. Typically that water is going to filter into the ground and hit the water table and it's going to move laterally along the ground and follow typically along the same, same way as the ground surface goes to the nearest closest uh, lake, river, stream. And then at that point it'll be discharged eventually down into the ocean. Next please. This is a slide looking at uh, two wells on the right hand side as far as well placement goes, it has a little bit to do with how water moves and how contamination moves under the ground surface. If you look at the right, the house, the, the brown house that has the well on it, has a well that's down gradient from the source of contamination there. So it's a little bit more susceptible to contamination than the well on the right hand side that is serving the uh, outbuilding there. The, out, the well on the right hand side is away from is up gradient from the source of contamination. So the flow does not follow the movement into the well. And also if you look on the left-hand side, there's an old abandoned well. We require all old abandoned wells to be sealed by licensed contractor. They seal it with the sealing material that does not allow surface water to get into the well. Otherwise, old wells can act as a conduit for contamination and they lead directly from the ground surface into the aquifer. So we don't want that to happen. We want to prevent the, protect the aquifer and prevent contamination from entering in through that route that way. Next, please. This is um, just a picture of the, um, of the setback distances that we have um, in our rules. The more potential for contamination, the farther away we want to see that from the well. So if you have a copy of the well owner's guide, guide it uh, does have this picture in here. Otherwise you can go onto our website and you can pull this picture off and find out if you have a question of how far it well has to be away from a certain source of contamination. You can figure it out that way. Next, please. A Little bit about groundwater contamination and how it works. Um, water as, is a very good solvent. It easily dissolves contaminants in the ground surface and carries them downward. Shallow wells and wells near contamination sources, sources have the most potential to be contamination, contaminated because they obviously have the less chance for attenuation by the soil or dilution by the other groundwater that's present. And nitrate, like Sarah said, is one of the more common human controlled contaminants. Uh, it moves readily with the, with the water and it has a little bit more difficult time uh, removing nitrate. It has to be attenuated through mostly through dilution. 
Next, please. Um, the good news is that soils do filter out most forms of contamination. Confining in layers like we talked about a while back, such as clay, will limit downward movement of water and, and down, downward movement of surface contaminants. Next, please. I'd like to talk a little bit tonight about uh, wells and plumbing and maintenance. Um, there's different routes uh, contamination can get into the water supply system. I'd just like to talk a little about those and uh, how you can uh, maintain and uh, visibly inspect your wells to prevent that from happening. Next, please. So if you look, um, look in these three wells, they all have broken conduits. A conduit is a place where the electrical wire goes down to the submersible pump that's inside of the well. If you look at those right underneath the cap, every one of those conduits are broken. And it, those are designed to be tightly fitting in there so that um, when, when it basically prevents contamination, bugs and critters and things from crawling inside of the well and causing a bacterial problem. Next, please. Um, all wells are also required to have a vented screen vent in the well, well, top of the well casing or in the well cap. And uh, this allows equilibration of the pressure when the pump kicks in. It'll also vent off any gases that are dissolved in the water. And um, if you look on the two pictures on the left in the, in the middle one, they do have screen vents on. The one on the cap on the right does have an overlapping cap, so it is vented, but there's no screen in there. And typically we see wells like this um, have problems with bugs and spiders and things like that crawling inside of the well. And these type of caps are no longer allowed by the well code. They were eliminated in 1993 when the well code was revised. So if you do have one of those caps on there, we recommend that you switch it out to the more modern vented caps. Um, and this, these are pictures of uh, damaged well casings or well casings that are designed or set up that, are, that can allow contamination into the, into the well. The uh, well on the left-hand side has a crack casing. It must have got bumped by a lawnmower or an ATV possibly or um, something else that uh, the casing ended up getting cracked. The picture on the middle is a uh, person landscaped um, around the top of the well so that the top of the well casing is and the well cap is flush to the ground surface. Like we talked about earlier, those caps have vented, screen vented caps on there, but that doesn't prevent, uh, if you have a heavy rainfall event or a snow melt, you can get surface water leached into the, through the cap and into the well. So we wanna see those well casings at least a foot above ground. And on the right hand side, there's a picture of a well cap that's been lifted off the well, maybe the the cap was not secured and the frost grabbed onto that conduit pipe and pulled it up there or something else happened to it to prevent that from uh, uh, forming a tight seal on top of that well casing. So if you have any of those problems that are pictured there, you should have them repaired or fixed or modified. Next. And like you said, there's, we're trying to eliminate contamination from getting in the well. This is a picture of a mouse that got into the well. It's a picture from a downhole camera that we had. The well was having problems with the cold form bacteria problem that it just wouldn't go away until they pulled the pump and ran a camera down there and found there was a mouse that had crawled into the well and got in there. So you never know what to expect when you get into these wells, especially ones that are not maintained very good. Next. Next, yeah. Um, here's a couple of pictures of wells that are, the one on the left is in a pit and the one on the right is near a body of water, surface body of water. Both wells and pits and surface body water or wells near surface bodies of water are susceptible to contamination from flooding. In the pit um, on the left, it was, uh, it was after a rainfall event and uh, you got pretty wet in there. On the right, we do have uh, uh, we do have separation distances from sources of or surface water bodies of 35 feet. So we want to keep all wells at least 35 feet away from any surface water. And again, wells are not allowed in pits any longer, so we shouldn't see anything like the one on the left hand side. Next, please. Um, another potential source of contamination is plumbing inside of the building. 
On the left here, you'll see a um, water softener drain. It's hooked directly into the sewer line. Um, you can have problems with, with bacteria crawling back in through that pipe and in, get into your water supply system through the water softener drain tube that way. So we don't allow that to be plumbed that way. And um, same similar thing on the right-hand side, the discharge line is submerged in the floor drain, which can act as a source of contamination and uh, you can get contaminants back siphoning into the water softener and uh, causing problems that way. Next. Two uh, corrections for those things is you could um, cr create an air gap that's shown on the right hand or the left hand side that uh, the water softener discharge goes into a pipe that's lifted out of the out of the floor drain and it'll it'll drain into the floor drain that way. Or the picture on the right has a has the discharge line going into its own designated drain line that's not hooked up to the sewer system. That white pipe you see there goes directly outside to some point of discharge and you know, there's no direct cross connection there. Next. Um, another issue with the chemicals that possibly could get into your water supply would be boiler chemicals. Oftentimes there's makeup water hooked or pl they're plumbed in there so that there could be makeup water added to the boiler system. And that's fine long as there's the approved backflow prevention on those systems. Um, the one on, yeah, both of those systems, they need to have some sort of a backflow prevention to prevent the boiler chemicals from entering into the well. Next, please. This is a question. I think we can skip over this, Sarah. Okay, but you guys can all just think of this to yourself. When did you last have your well tested? Because we're going to talk about what the right answer is, and it kind of depends on the contaminant, but there's no really right or wrong answer. It's just kind of asking you, when did you last test your well? So you can, you can think about it. All right, as far as water testing goes, um, we, uh, <clears throat> it's a good idea to get your well tested routinely and it's different for every different contaminant. Uh, we always recommend going to a certified lab and you can go to a certified lab by doing a Google search by looking up environmental labs in your area. I'll go over that a little bit more in detail later here. But as far as the con individual contaminants that are present, uh, coal from bacteria, we recommend it testing every year. Nitrate, we recommend every other year. Arsenic at least once. Um, lead at least once and manganese before a baby drinks the water. Uh, testing is even more important if you have a young children drinking the water because they're a little bit more susceptible to the problems associated with contamination because their bodies are a lot smaller. Next, please. As far as finding a laboratory, we, I just mentioned you can um, talk to your environmental and public health services if they provide water well testing. You can do an internet search under well testing results and options, and that will come up with the health department's um, certified labs. And then you can go to each individual lab and see what they're testing for. And uh, they'll have a contact information there with a, with a, uh, a phone number so that you can direct contact them directly and get their the sampling procedures and their sampling containers that they require. Um, otherwise, each individual lab has a little bit different sampling requirements. Next, please. Um, going a little bit into individual contaminants, coal from bacteria. Any form of coal from bacteria that are detected are, are considered harmful. They are used as an indicator organism that they're not supposed to be in the system, so why are they in there? They could indicate uh, other infectious bacteria, viruses, or parasites might be in the water. Um, the, if these pathogens are present, they could cause diarrhea, vomiting, cramps, nausea, headaches, fever, or fatigue. And typically cold form bacteria are introduced uh, if any work has been done on the plumbing or if the well casing, the well cap has been damaged. Next. So what do you do if you do have coal from bacteria in your well? Um, 
you, get, you need to get your water from a safe, reliable source, first of all, or an alternative source. You want to inspect, inspect your drinking water system to make sure that there's no obvious routes of contamination. If it's a broken cap or a broken casing that needs to be repaired, you really need to get that repaired first before you do disinfect it because the, the uh, problem is just going to come back. And then you want to disinfect your well and water sp supply system. You can hire a licensed well contractor or else you can go onto our website and pull off the directions for um, disinfecting your well. Next. Nitrate is another uh, contaminant that we test for. Um, the drinking water standard set at 10 milligrams per liter and um, it infects primarily infants under the age of six months that are at higher at risk. It affects how the water or how the uh, blood carries oxygen and can cause uh, blue baby syndrome, which can be deadly in certain infants if they uh, drink too much of the water that has the high nitrate. The sources of nitrate come from agriculture, residential fertilizers, or else it could come from human or animal waste, including feedlots or sewers. Next. Um, every well that gets uh, constructed in Minnesota gets tested for nitrate. If you look on the left-hand side there, it has the most recent uh, nitrate uh, results that we have. The, the dark blue dots are anything over 10. The light blue dots are range from three to 10 parts per million. And uh, the map on the right is a map put together by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. It shows uh, some of their uh, well testing that they've done on existing wells. These are not newer wells, so you have a wide variety of well construction present. And typically they're in an area which have heavily um, row crops that are that use a, quite a bit of fertilizer and they're on coarse sandy soils that uh, are a little bit more susceptible. The wells are more susceptible to contamination. So that's on the right hand side. If you look at Red, Redwood County, you really don't see a lot on the right hand map. On the left hand map, you do see some hits of uh, wells that do have a little bit elevated in, uh, nitrate. Next, please. So what do you do if you do have nitrate over 10 parts per million? First, you wanna get your drinking water from a safe source until you can address the problem. You for sure don't wanna give it to infants under the age of six months. You wanna inspect your drinking water system, make sure that there's not any potential source of nitrate near your well. And if there is, you wanna remove them. Uh, you could consider drilling a new well and going into a deeper, more protective aquifer. Maybe your well is complete in a shallow sand and it's susceptible to nitrate contamination. If you drill a well below a clay confining layer, typically that clay layer will prevent the downward, the downward movement of nitrate and uh, protect your well from the nitrate contamination that's on the ground surface. Next, please. Arsenic, uh, any level of arsenic is of concern, but the drinking water standard set at 10 parts per billion. And um, as far as the health impacts go, your risk uh, is from drinking water over a long period of time. It's not gonna hurt you to drink a little bit of arsenic. Uh, say you do find out that you, you, you test your water and you do have arsenic in your water, but you've been drinking it for a period of time. Really the risk is over the long, long period of time, if you continue to consume water high in arsenic for years and years, you could run into problems with uh, increased risk, risk of cancer of the bladder, lungs, and liver, uh, reduced uh, intelligence in children, and there's also some concerns with diabetes and heart disease. Uh, arsenic will nat is naturally uh, found in soil and rock. It's found pretty much everywhere in Minnesota. It was brought in with the glaciers tens of thousands of years ago. And um, the thing is, is that arsenic going to be stuck to the rock or the soil, or is it going to be released? And that depends on the, the water chemistry, and it's all very specific to each individual well. So that um, you can't really say if your neighbor has high arsenic, you're going to have high arsenic, or if your neighbor has low arsenic, you're going to have low arsenic. It really is independent of each individual well. So you really need to test your well to make that determination. Uh, some forms of arsenic was used in pesticides and for wood preservatives, but that's only a few spots in Minnesota where there's a problem with that. Next, please. As far as where arsenic is, has, is being detected, again, the map on the left-hand side shows the new wells constructed where arsenic is present. The, the dark blue dots are greater than 10 micro, 
micrograms per liter, which is over the drinking water standard. The light blue dots are anywhere from two micrograms to 10 micrograms. So if you're looking west central Minnesota, it's kind of a hot spot for arsenic. Center Minnesota, west of the cities. There are a few highlights in Redwood County that do show a little bit of arsenic. So it's important to get your water tested for arsenic just in case you end up being in one of those wells that uh, do show elevated arsenic. The map on the right just is a different uh, demonstration. It demonstrates uh, arsenic on the county level. Next, please. So if you do have arsenic that's easily detected, you want to consider um, drilling a well necessarily isn't, uh, isn't necessarily an, uh, going to correct it. It may fix the arsenic, but there's no guarantee. And it is kind of an expensive experiment to drill a well in hope of getting a different arsenic result. So oftentimes we do recommend home treatment. And typically we see reverse osmosis, distillation, or more common uh, media that it's used as iron oxide media. It's a different, it works like a kind of a um, granular filter that the arsenic will stick to the iron oxide media. And then you dispose of the media and replenish the media and uh, it will be good to go again. Next. Lead is another uh, kind of a tricky thing to test for and because it's typically not found in groundwater. So you have to so it's really dependent on how you collect your sample. Lead comes from uh, lead pipes, lead solder, brass components and faucets, things that are in your plumbing. And um, the health impacts are basically for babies, children and under the age of six months pregnant women are at higher at risk. They have tendency to uh, show some nervous system impacts and some brain and kidney function. And they can slow the development and cause learning behaviors and hearing problems. But as far as, so if, as far as the lead in the plumbing system, you need to, uh, depending on how you collect your sample, if you collect your sample right away out of the faucet and your faucet has lead components in there, brass components that contain lead, you're gonna get an elevated uh, lead result. Um, and if you do have, solder, lead solder in your, in your plumbing, you could get an elevated result because of the lead solder. Next, please. So basically the way the lead gets into the drinking water, the water sits there over a period of time and over a period of time, it's gonna dissolve the lead from the lead, lead component in the system. And typically you're gonna see your highest lead uh, elevations Right, uh, when you come home from work in the day, say the system hasn't been running and er everybody's been gone to school or to work and um, the water's been sitting in the plumbing, and it's gonna have the opportunity to dissolve lead from the, from the lead solder, less lead components, or maybe in the more, first thing in the morning and when everybody's waking up and getting going in the morning. What you wanna do is if you do have high lead elevation, um, you want to let the water run for at least 30 to 60 seconds, preferably longer, depending on what, how your plumbing is set up. You want to use the cold drinking water, or cold water for drinking and cooking. And if possible, to reduce the lead, you can uh, replace the lead component that contains the, the lead. Um, as far as treatment goes, you could use reverse osmosis, distillation, or some carbon pitchers do filter out lead also. Next. Manganese is one of a newer uh, contamination or contaminant that we are, the health department's been concerned over. Uh, it's primarily uh, harmful for babies under the age of one year. The drinking water standard is set at 100 micrograms per liter. For everyone else, it's set at 30, 300 micrograms per liter. Um, manganese is uh, associated, typically associated with iron. If you have high iron, typically you have high manganese and they kind of go hand in hand. So that's one thing to look for. Uh, manganese uh, or iron will stain your fixtures brown, but manganese stains your fixtures black. So you may have concerns with manganese if you have a lot of black staining in your fixtures. The risk is from drinking water over a long period of time. Again, similar to arsenic. Or I should, it's not exactly the same as arsenic, but as far as drink, it's, it's a long-term exposure risk. It's not gonna hurt you if you drink a few glasses here and there or over a short period of time. It's the exposure over a long period of time. It can cause problems with memory, uh, attention or motor skills. 
and can cause learning behaviors and problems with children. And uh, it does, like you said, it is a naturally occurring contaminant and formed in uh, soil and rock. Next, please. Uh, as far as probability of you having manganese in your water, this is a map. We don't really have good testing data as far as statewide goes, but this is a probability map. The darker the colors, the more likely you have manganese in your water. So if you look down Redwood County, it's kind of on the edge of things there. There is a few, uh, there is a few areas that uh, do have elevated manganese, or there's a few wells that have been tested that do have manganese in there. So you probably want to get your well tested if you have a concern with that. Next, please. So what do you do if you do have unsafe levels of manganese? You want to use um, a different source of water for making formula and juice for a baby or under the age of one year. You want to consider home water treatment. Uh, water softening is effective in moving uh, just manganese. It works similar to that as far as uh, similar to removing of iron. If your water softener removes iron, it'll also remove manganese. When that level gets too high, it's not going to work. You're probably going to have to work on a, an iron removal filter or some sort of other filter that's going to remove the higher levels of manganese. But some carbon pitchers filters will work on removing manganese or also distillation. Next. So we've talked about contaminants and, um, and different ways contaminants can get into your water and what to test for. Um, as far as this water sample collection, you, if you do decide to test your water for different contaminants, you want to be as close to the well as possible from a regularly used faucets. You want to collect your sample before the water treatment device. You want to remove faucet screens and rubber washers, and then uh, if possible, flame the faucet before you collect a water sample. And if you can't do that, use rubbing alcohol to disinfect the sample tap. Um, and then you want to let the water run, the cold water run for at least five minutes before you collect your water sample. Um, I think this sampling directions will be in your test kits if you do, uh, when you do request a test kit, it'll have all this information in, in there. Next, please. So just in summary now, um, what can you do to help assure that you have a good drinking water system? Well, I like to think about it as, uh, um, how did the contaminant get, think about how the contaminant can get into your into your water or the water supply system first way it could get into there is through the groundwater it could be contaminated with arsenic or nitrate or manganese it could be from a broken or inadequate well construction that would lead to a bacterial problem typically and um, you also could have problems with your plumbing components you could have brass or lead containing uh, components in your plumbing that would lead to lead contamination. Or you could have a plumbing cross connection such as a water softener drain hose that's into the sewer system could cause a bacterial problem. Or you could have a cross connection with uh, boiler chemicals which would create a, con con a contamination with a chemical problem. So you got to think about how your system is set up, where are the weak points in the system, and what potentially could get into your uh, system through those routes. And then if you do have your water tested, you kind of have to work backwards and say, well, where, if I have high nitrate, where is this coming from? If I have a, some sort of bacterial problem, where is this com possibly coming from? And, and get that repaired first. Next, please. So how to protect your private well from a uh, private drinking water system. We like to use the acronym of TIPS. You want to test your water. You want to inspect your well. And you want to protect your well and then you can uh, want to seal unused wells. And you have you have a homeowner um, have total control over this. Yeah, you, know, you can do any of those things there and or and or all of them and uh, to protect your water supply system. And uh, we recommend that you do 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 an inspection and do a water test and, and see what your system is, um, what the status of it is. Next, please. Where can you get more information on your well? Uh, if you do have that unique well number that we talked about earlier, you can uh, call any of the uh, district offices of the health department, give them that number and they can look up all that information. You also can go on to do a Google search for Minnesota Well Index. It'll, when it pops up, 
you can search through the index through um, for if you have that well number or by an address or a township range and section. The only thing you want to realize is that information that's in county well index is based on the time of construction. So possibly your your address has changed from a rural route number to a 911 number, then you would not be able to search by address. And typically we'd have to search by township range and section and then go through individual wells and, and kind of pick and choose is it, if that's your well or not. The other thing you can do is you can contact your well company that drilled your well. Oftentimes a well contractor will put uh, their sticker or their company logo on the well head or possibly on the control panel in your basement. And they want to have you do, want to do the service work when time comes to service your well. So they'll leave their number there. That's a good resource and good place to look. Next please. And that's all I have for right now. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Yep. So um, I do want to encourage you guys, um, if you don't see that chat box, uh, to open it. And if you have questions for either Jeff or I, uh, feel free to ask them as we're kind of going through this last section, was, which is about maintenance of septic systems um, and operation. Uh, but also when the presentation, when we're done, we will also have time for individual questions. You guys can turn on your mics and we can have a conversation too. So just use all of those options available to you. So, so the last topic here is what can you do to have a good septic system and particularly moving forward, you know, maintenance and activities in your home that will lengthen the life of your good septic system. So the first thing is, is understanding what is in your backyard. So do you have one septic tank? Do you have multiple tanks? Do you have a pump tank in your system that has an alarm on it? So um, you wanna know that information. Do you have an effluent filter? Do you have an alarm? So how would you get that information? Well, one, if you have a copy of your design or as built, um, all that information is there. Sometimes people don't have that. And if your system was put in in the last 25 years, there's a really good chance uh, the county has records. And many counties have records going back even further than 25 years. I mean, there are counties that have records that are 50 years old. I will tell you the older those records are, the kind of less accurate they are. We've just gotten more precise uh, when we do those drawings and have that sort of information. But um, I would definitely, if you don't know anything about what's really buried in your backyard, I would start there. And if for some reason you have a system that there isn't a record of, the next time you're having your system maintained or you could have an installer out, they've been in, most of them have been in this industry a long time and they can really be helpful and tell you actually what's in the ground. Because that is the hard thing about septic systems and even some of our well issues. It's kind of out of sight and it's hard from the surface to really know what's going on under there. So with that, we'll move into maintenance. So again, this is just one example of what a septic maintenance truck looks like that might show up at your house. And I'll come back to why this kind of truck is important. But so what do, what do you guys think? How often should you have your septic system maintained? So is it every year? Is it every two years? Is it every three years? And you know, the answer is, is these are all right. They're all correct because it really does depend on your use. So we will talk about really the minimum time period you should go, but there isn't one magic right answer. It really is just like the equivalent of changing your oil, right? How often do you change your oil? Well, you know, every, well, it depends on what kind of oil you use, right? But the usual rule of thumb is well, every 3,000 miles or 4,000 or 5,000. So, um, so it really does depend on use. So maintenance is mandatory. There, it is not optional. It's always been in our code that septic systems need to be taken care of. And we usually think that just really includes emptying the tank. But it also is, if you have one of those filters, they should be confirming that if you have a pump, every pump has an alarm. And the purpose of that alarm is to tell you if there's a high water event in that tank, a higher than normal, which means typically your pump needs to be replaced. So it's very important that that pump be operational and working because the last thing you want is that sewage to come to the surface or back up into your home. 
the last thing that it's good for them to do and also for yourself is to walk that drain field or mound area to make sure everything looks normal. And we'll talk more about that coming up. So believe it or not, there's a device out there that can measure how much sludge and scum is in your tank. So they're generically called sludge judges. There's different devices that do it. But technically, your septic tank only needs to be cleaned uh, when it is more than 25% of the tank is full of sludge and scum. Generally speaking, when a septic a pumper maintainer shows up at your property that with that big pump truck, guess what he's going to do? He's going to clean your tank, right? And there's nothing really wrong with that. But I do encourage people to ask how full your tank was because there are some people who should pump it every two years. And there could be some people that at that three-year interval, their tank isn't full yet and wouldn't have to be pumped. Um, at that point, like I said, it maybe is just more cost-effective to have it cleaned. But, um, but it is really nice if your maintainer has a device like this that, and they can tell you how full it is. So when they clean tanks, um, sometimes what they'll have to do is what you see in here in this picture, and that is dig up the manhole. So most manholes are relatively close to the surface, usually within 12 inches. But you, um, again, you need to access it as you see here. The other thing that you'll notice this maintainer has in his hand is a pry bar that he's kind of pushing the sludge around. Sludge is a very accurate word. It's very heavy. So it's not as simple as just dropping that hose down there and sucking it out. We want to, as much as possible, remove the sludge and scum. And keep in mind, when we say cleaning, the tank does not get crystal clean. Their goal is to remove most of the sludge and scum. There might be a little stuff left behind, but the good thing is that just helps that tank get back up to speed. So again, everyone who does this needs to be licensed and bonded by the MPCA. And typically, as I mentioned, flushing and back flushing is actually required. The other reason why they often have to use a pry bar like this is to kind of get into the corners of the tank, particularly when you only have one manhole. So when your tank is pumped, they must pump through the manhole. So here's an example, if you look at the picture on the right, of a system that has a pump. And I can tell because it has a pedestal there with electricity running to it. So I know that there's a pump in there and I know that there's an alarm. And the other thing you will notice is he's pumping out that tank as well. Um, ideally, a pump tank that really has a pump sitting at the bottom of the tank wouldn't have much sludge in it. But over time, some can build up, so they should look in your pump tank. So what you'll see to the left of that manhole, or to the right, is those smaller inspection ports. And some of you may only see that in your backyard. But they cannot clean a septic tank through that six-inch pipe. There is, the hose will fit in it, but there is no way to get the tank clean. So if your manholes aren't to grade, they need to be dug up. You may consider at that time adding a riser uh, to the system, but that's a conversation I would have with your maintainer, depending on the depth and access issues. So you cannot get a septic tank clean through the inspection pipes. Um, maintainers are also required by state rules to give you a report. Um, it's not a report that goes to the county. It's not an enforcement. It's more like when you think about getting your oil changed, like your 20-point inspection. So what is required to be on that form is the date, the gallons removed. Are there any signs of tank leakage? And this would be important, right? If you were having groundwater leaking in or sewage leaking out, how did they remove the septage? Where are they taking the waste, the septage out of the tank? Where's that going? Why did they do maintenance? Are there any safety concerns about the maintenance uh, hole cover? So when you see in this picture right to the left is the maintenance cover. Um, keep in mind, a typical septic tank has four to five feet of liquid in it. That means if a child falls in that tank, your beloved dog, they will drown, right? So it is very important that those lids be secure. You see concrete tanks like this sometimes, poor quality concrete can uh, start to break over time. Um, there was actually a daycare in uh, Chisago County where the manhole, a child was standing and it literally fell straight into the tank. Um, it was at a daycare. The daycare provider had to jump in the tank 
the good thing is as an adult, you're taller than four feet. So her head was above the liquid level and basically held up the child. So just keep in mind that those tanks do pose a safety risk. So they'll tell you if anything needs to be repaired. And then finally, are there any other problems with your system? You know, easy things like inspection caps that were hit with mowers, you know, those sorts of things um, might be included on that as well. And some things are more critical than others. If your baffle fell off, that's a repair you need to make, right? Um, the, the cap on, you know, your drain field, maybe that's something you pick up, right, next time you go to the hardware store. So where does it go when they pump these tanks? Um, a majority of it is land applied following federal EPA requirements, although some is taken to wastewater treatment plants. If they are applying it to fields, it is very regulated. It has to be lined to raise the pH to kill bacteria and viruses or injected below the surface. It's applied at ergonomic rates based on the nitrogen levels. It has to meet setbacks. There's restriction on grazing, so it's a very regulated activity. So here's a picture showing effluent screen. The screen is washed off directly into the septic tank, right, not into your yard. So this is typically done at the inlet side of the tank because we don't want to wash it off and have that stuff go out to the drain field. So how often do you need to maintain your system? As I've already mentioned, it depends on sludge and scum buildup. So this is impacted by water and product usage. But the state code does require that you have it evaluated every three years. It doesn't say pumped, it says evaluated. And I do want to note that when you have someone out to clean your septic tank, they are not doing an inspection. So an inspection, particularly it's called a compliance inspection, is often done, for instance, when a property sells. That is a very different activity that may include tank pumping, but that is something that's done to fill out a state inspection form to say whether or not your system meets the state code. If you want that to be done, you need to ask for a compliance inspection. A typical maintainer is just going to come out to clean your system. So you should have your system looked at every one to three years. And I would actually encourage you to be there and have a conversation. Ask them how your system is working. Ask them how full your tanks were. It can give you a good handle about how often you need to maintain your system. Um, if for any reason you have a seasonal home or cabin, this, the requirement still applies that it be looked at every three years. Do you need to put any additives into your system? So you can pretty much go into any hardware store in Minnesota and you will find septic tank additives. To date, there has been no third party independent research that shows any of these do any good. So there's kind of three different ones that are marketed starters. You don't need to start it. There's lots of bacteria and wastewater. We don't need to feed the bacteria. You are the food. Every time you flush the toilet, you are feeding the system. And finally, there are some that are marketed as cleaners, and our regulations actually ban the use of these because the concern is, is that they would take the subtle sludge in the tank and send it out to the drain field. So at this time, because we don't have any good data, we do not recommend adding these so they have the risk of damaging your septic system, but probably the other big point is, is that to me, they're often just a waste of money, that you're better taking that money and just regularly maintaining your system. So if you do have a pump as part of your system, so every mound again has a pump, um, they should confirm that your pump is accessible because it will need to be replaced. So a typical septic pump is gonna last 10 to 15 years. But when it gets removed, it needs to be accessible. It sits on a block at the bottom of the tank, so it should be elevated off the bottom. It needs to be replaceable, operable with floats, and alarmed. So, and as I mentioned, that tank may need pumping if there's sludge present. So how would you go about hiring a maintainer or inspector? Certainly getting referrals is great. Um, the county may actually have a list of people who work in the county. Uh, regularly. Um, you can also, if you just Google MPCA SSTS license search, there's a search tool that comes up and you have to pick a county. And just keep in mind that is the county that the company resides in. So most, again, people in this industry don't just work in one county. They work in a, you know, a several county area. 
And then I would, you know, when you call them up, I would ask them questions. And I wouldn't just ask the last one. That's where um, sometimes my German heritage goes is, you know, looking for the, the best deal, right? But keep in mind that sometimes you might be talking about the difference of $25. And if they actually get your tank clean, that's worth every penny. So you could ask them, are they going to pump through the manhole? Do they own a sludge judge? Do they back flush? Do they recommend additives? And the answers to those might help you choose between um, several companies. So moving on to the soil treatment system, um, you do want to replace cracked or missing inspection pipes. That's true over your tank as well. You also want to make sure that for the most part, rainwater that falls over your septic system runs off as opposed to has to go through. So when septic systems are installed, they're designed to be crowned to shed surface water, but sometimes you can have settling over that area, or maybe you put in a new shed and now the roof runoff is going right over the septic system. So on an annual basis, some people can see their septic system every day, and sometimes it's more out of sight. So if you have one that's more out of sight on an annual basis, you should be looking at it. So other things to keep in mind with your septic system, compaction is very bad for the soil. The soil, as I mentioned before, is designed to be aerobic and how it gets oxygen to it is naturally through the air, passively into the soil. So you want to avoid traffic across the system. So certainly large vehicles, anything larger than a riding lawnmower should regularly be trafficking over your system. Also large animals, right? So we're talking about livestock, even something like deer that have a regular pattern over your system. Your dog's not the end of the world, but it's more horses, things like that, because they really can cause compaction issues. If you do have inspection pipes sticking up in your yard and, they, and you don't like the sight of them, they can be cut flush. Or the best idea is to actually buy some irrigation boxes. I have a picture coming up where those are at the surface because they really help blend in, particularly if you have a nice manicured lawn. Um, newer mound systems or systems that have a pump in them, some of these now have clean outs on the end. So I'm going to show you this picture coming up. So this shows the end of a newer mound system where we're actually checking uh, those lines. So you can see the water squirting up a hole we put in. And in this picture, it's actually water, not sewage, because <laughs> it was a brand new system. So if you have something that looks like this in your backyard, they're a great new addition to systems that were put in in the last 10 years because, it, because over time, solids can build up in those pipes and now we actually can flush those lines. So as far as what you should grow across the top of your septic system, we recommend using plants that prefer dry soil. And that may sound counterintuitive because we're putting all this water out, but keep in mind, the closest that water is, the very closest is 12 inches. But most of the time, that water is several feet below the surface. So most of the water from your septic system is not evaporating up, it's moving down. So it can actually be pretty dry across the top of your system. So the benefits of this, it will prevent their roots from interfering with the septic system. And do keep in mind, the larger the plant, the more extensive the root system is. Um, we do not recommend planting edible plants such as vegetables and herbs. Not because I'm really worried about bacteria and viruses in your carrots, more because what does the, the typical vegetable garden look like today? Right, it's bare soil, and bare soil is much more likely uh, to have frost deeper in it, and typically vegetable gardens also need watering, and we want to avoid things that need a lot of watering. Um, you never want to plant trees or shrubs directly over your soil treatment system. So, you know, you can see in this picture, it's a wooded lot. And, you know, off at a distance, trees are fine. But you never want to have anything woody growing across the top of your septic system. So, again, it's okay if you're planting new trees to frame the system with trees at a distance, but nothing woody. Trees should be at least 20 feet away, but also keep in mind how big that tree is going to be someday. So also avoid planting trees that are known for seeking water, such as poplar, maple, willow, and elm, which is a lot of the trees we have here in Minnesota. If you're going to plant trees like that, they should be at least 50 feet away. 
Uh, we do also have a nice fact sheet on our website that was done by some landscaping experts here at the U, um, particularly around landscaping mounds. So problems, again, the coffee can instead of the actual inspection cap cover, um, ATVs and snowmobiles are problematic, um, cause compaction, and a snowmobile compacts the snow, and fluffy snow is a great insulator. Um, I actually had that conversation today with the property owner was, you know, she's worried about freezing this winter. And it's good reason to be because we don't have any snow, right? So if it gets 30 below next week, that frost will start, right, going into the soil. So um, the winters, we definitely have problems with freezing is when we don't get snow um, and it gets really cold for extended periods of time. So the system on the right, on the top corner there, would also be much more likely to have freezing issues because it doesn't have a good vegetative cover. So if you're worried about freezing, um, another good tip is to stop mowing around Labor Day, let your grass get long. That helps insulate and hold snow in place when we get it. So the last topic we're going to uh, touch on here is things you can do around your home. So these are some general ones first, and then we're going to go a little room by room. So General things that will help extend the life of your septic system and protect our waters are to one, conserve water. So to think about how you use water in your home and also not just how much, but when you use it. Um, so spreading it out is better. So avoiding things like Saturday laundry day where you do all your laundry for the whole week for your whole family on one day. It's much better to do a couple loads a week and we'll talk more about it. Um, be mindful of the products you use and limit cleaners. I didn't say eliminate, but just use the minimal amount you need to keep your home clean and safe. Um, do not use your system as a garbage can. And the biggest area we have a problem with this is people's toilets. There are more things going into people's toilets that are not um, a ro um, uh, organic that the, the system can't deal with. So. Um, All right, I'm back. So, um, and the last thing is if you are having problems, don't wait for the big problem. So I remember um, I bought a quite old home and I was getting the inspection done on it. Um, and I was with the, the home inspector and we ran into, the, we were looking at the water heater and he's like, you know, this water heater, this time it was about 35 years old. It's like, you know, he goes, do you know what happens when a water heater fails? And I actually didn't at the time. This was a while ago. He's like, well, you know, it leaks water all over under your basement. So, you know, you might want to think about replacing this. So if your septic system fails someday, it's not water, right? It'll be sewage in your basement. So it's better to be proactive about it. And when they come out, that doesn't mean that you need a new system tomorrow. But they could help you figure out, is there a problem? Is there anything you can do? But if you do have an older system, do keep in mind, it will need to be replaced at some interval. So things you want to think about as far as the products you use around your home is things that are sanitizers. And I am a little worried by our current uh, situation here in the US with COVID that we are using a lot more sanitizers than we were before. So for instance, I had never seen it, maybe it existed, but there is now laundry soap that actually um, states right on it that it sanitizes. And so it's not to say that one cup of bleach will kill off all the good bacteria in the septic system, but it, ha it they can have a cumulative impact. So antibiotic soaps and wipes are now used by over 75%. This data came pre-COVID, so I would guess that this number is even higher um, than the 75%. So cleaning products do have labels on them, but they're not for septic systems. Um, so I would encourage you to choose products that, as much as possible, to avoid products that have a poison or a danger sign on them. So the one that I can remember when I was, that we used when I was a kid was iron out. It would like, you know, if you had uh, iron in your like sink, you would just run it around the outside of the sink and it would just magically eat away the iron but you didn't want to breathe it or have it touch your skin. Not good for the environment. Not, and if it's not, um, if it has that poison or danger on it, we put the Mr. Yuck symbol on it when I was a kid, right? 
um, that means that it will kill the bacteria. So its use should be minimized to the least amount or eliminated if possible. Um, if it has a warning sign on it, uh, that means it's limited use should have very little impact. And if it has a caution, like something like cleanser, right, means the product will have very little impact. So we just really, whenever possible, want to choose the least toxic product. Um, this will also mean that we're putting less CECs down the drain. So a great resource if you're looking for evaluation is of different um, cleaners and um, even things like makeup. The Environmental uh, Working Group is a nonprofit organization which rates products with an A, B, C, D, or F. Um, it's rating them for their impact to public health and the environment. So if you are choosing products that are A's and B's, they're also going to be much better for our septic system and for the environment in general. So how much water do we use in a typical home? Um, we size septic systems based on peak capacity. And peak capacity is 150 gallons per day per bedroom, which does assume two people per bedroom. So this means that for most homes, we are oversizing the septic system, but that also helps our septic systems last a long time. A typical person uses 50, 60, sometimes 70 gallons uh, per day. And so if you're a typical person, that means you're using 28,000 gallons. A typical family of three will put out about 70,000 gallons of water a year, which I actually think, if you think about where your septic drain field is, that's a lot of water. And it's pretty amazing that the soil can send that water back into the environment. And now thinking about the community you live in, um, let's say it's a township with 250 homes, that would equate to 15 million gallons per year of wastewater. So just another example why it's really important our septic systems be working properly. So where do we use this? So most of our water usage, you can see almost 60% is in the bathroom. Um, right behind that laundry uses about 17%. Uh, the one that's always disappointing to this, and this was a study published in 2016, that 12% of the water usage in a typical house is due to leaks. So that toilet that sticks, the running faucets, all of those sorts of things. And then finally, we use about 11% of our water um, in the kitchen. So how can we optimize this? Well, the number one single water user in our homes is our toilets. So if your bathroom looks anything like the one on your right, your realtor and your septic system would like you to remodel, right? So those old five plus gallon toilets, uh, you're talking about five or more gallons every time you flush the toilet. So the new ones use 1.28 or even less per flush. Uh, the other big issue with toilets is fi fixing those leaking problems. So if you have a toilet that runs either a little or a lot, that can really add a lot of water to the septic system. So when it comes time to clean your toilet bowl, I don't know that the dog's the best answer, right? But you just want to avoid automatic sanitizers. So in, um, most of the time, these are the blue cleaners, but there's even ones that are colorless now. Um, those are constantly sanitizing your bowl, which means you're sanitizing your septic system. So and it's the continual impact can cause long-term problems. So what we recommend is a small amount of a cleaner with more elbow grease, right? So unless you have super hard water, something like baking soda or Bonami with a toilet brush is what most of us need. If you do have lime or hard water deposits, you can try using hot white vinegar, Barkeeper's Friend, a Shaw's pad or a pumice stick. And that's something too that you really need to stay on top of. If you're not regularly dealing with that, it can get to be pretty problematic to remove it. Um, what should go in uh, the toilet bowl is toilet paper, no lotions, no wipes. I don't care if they say they're flushable. All that means is they flush, they do not degrade, and human waste. So no Q-nicks, Q-tips, cigarettes, hair, cotton balls, wipes, condoms, feminine products, unused medicines. None of that should be going into your septic system. Um, it should, most of that should be going into your garbage. The unused medicine is a little harder, that should very likely, um, again, and maybe Nick can speak to this when he comes back, um, it's getting more and more common that many counties have a location 
where unused medicines can be dropped off. It's often with your law enforcement because some of the pharmaceuticals we may have that are left over are controlled substances. So it's not something you just want to put out into your garbage or, you know, just drop off anywhere. So what about this septic safe label? Well, ultimately that is just marketing. So um, that you still don't want to flush it. So wipes, toilet bowl cleaners, and even kitty litter may be labeled this way. It often just means they'll flush, but there is no third party that verifies that word means anything. So on to bathing, which is 23% of our usage uh, ways to um, you know, increase the life of your septic system is to minimize leaks, um, consider low flow fixtures, um, and some of them have gotten better because no one really wants to take a shower with no water pressure, right? Um, you want to avoid cleaning your shower every day. So I don't know if any of you use this now or have heard of it, but there are basically shower cleaners that after every shower, you're supposed to spray down your shower. So that's a daily again, dose of sanitizer, even multiple times a day, right, if you had multiple people showering. You want to avoid antibacterial soap. Um, according to the American Medical Association, good old soap and hot water is more effective uh, than antibacterial products. And this even includes all those liquid products we're all using now because ultimately, if your hands have any grime or dirt on them, uh, it doesn't deal with that. So. Good old soap and water is the most effective method. You want to limit putting a lot of oils or salts in your system so Epsom salts become more common. Um, and again, once in a while isn't a problem, but again, if you were doing it on a very regular basis, you could impact the bacteria in the system. Uh, if you can handle using bar soap, you use a lot less soap, and the less soap in our, going down into our systems, the better. So people do use more liquid product. Uh, than if they use a bar. So if you get a clogged drain, you do not want to use most of the products on the market. So products, again, like Drano, will kill the bacteria in your system. So the first issue is, is can you limit what's going down the drain? So trying to catch as much of it as possible. If you do have a clog, is it a simple clog in the elbow under the sink that you can take it apart or plunge out? If it's a deeper in your plumbing system issue, you might need to get a snake or have someone come in who has one. And there are some DIY solutions out there for almost everything we're talking about. So I would always look at, if you can consume it, and again, I would never eat a half a cup of salt and a half a cup of baking soda, but those again are natural things that aren't going to kill off all the bacteria in the septic system. So moving on to laundry, uh, next time you need to get a new washing machine, certainly consider a front loader or an efficient top loader. Uh, you can see they go from 40 gallons down to less than 20. And in the long term, they are more expensive, but they pay for themselves and that you use less electricity to dry your clothes. Also think about spreading out your loads evenly as much as possible throughout the week and even the day if possible. You could also consider adding a lint filter. Believe it or not, when you wash your clothes, there's more lint that comes off from your washer than from your dryer, right? We all clean our dryer vent, but very few of us have a washing machine vent. So there, the example on the left is an aftermarket filter. It's actually made by a company in Minnesota. Um, it's available on Amazon. There's a couple other similar products out there. Um, again, it has a canister. How often you need to clean that depends on what you're laundering and how many people. Um, I have one, it's about once a week that it needs to be emptied into the garbage. You could try the option on the right as well, so a screen or some sort of pantyhose, but those get to be kind of a pain in the butt over time. And also some of the screens will still let some of the smaller fibers um, get uh, down the drain. So this is why we want to avoid Saturday laundry day, because when you're doing Saturday laundry day, you're also running the dishwasher and showering, you have the risk of stirring up your septic tank. So what should you use as far as soap? Um, you want to limit your bleach usage, limit your detergents to the minimal amount. And if you have a water softener, one of the benefits of a water softener is you need less soap. 
Um, you want to be careful using inexpensive powders as they contain clay as a filler. Uh, we do not recommend using liquid fabric softeners. Uh, they are petroleum-based products that can affect the stratification, those three layers in the septic tank. So some more natural solutions would be uh, baking soda or vinegar, dryer balls, um, an aluminum foil ball will work for static control. Um, in the kitchen, um, one of the newer questions we've had is about all the pods we're using, both in the kitchen and in laundry. Um, and there's kind of two issues. One is you may use more soap that way. You don't have the ability to control how much you're using. We don't have any studies to date, but I have heard anecdotally from some maintainers that they do believe they're problematic. So if you were going to err on the side of safety, you would avoid the use of pods. But again, I don't have any hard data to say they're certainly causing problems for sure. So moving on to the dishwasher, very little overall usage, but just keep in mind you don't want a lot of food particles going in your dishwasher. Probably the biggest issue uh, in the kitchen is sinks. You want to avoid fats and oils going down the drain, so you don't want to dump your bacon grease, your fry daddy, whatever it is. That should be dealt with with your solid waste. Um, the garbage disposal, um, the problem with garbage dispoil, disposals are you're adding more food. The food that you're adding has not been digested by us, so that we do a lot of the work of breaking down that food. The other problem is it chops it into tiny pieces, and those pieces don't settle out as well. So, and you are adding a little bit more water, but that's probably that's the least concern I have. So, our recommendations are is to not install one if you have one, just to minimize your usage. Um, here in Minnesota, the good news is if you have a home that already has one in it, uh, and it was designed that way from the beginning, we do require additional septic tank capacity to deal with the fact that we're putting more food down the drain so um, but ultimately if you love your garbage disposal and you're not going to change that practice um, it will likely increase the need for care and maintenance <clears throat> so other sources of water that are clean that shouldn't go into your septic system if you have a sump pump or tie line discharge it absolutely shouldn't it's a huge potential volume of water that will overload the septic system the dehumidifier probably here in Minnesota isn't as big of an issue as some southern states where it's really humid and that is running all the time. So um, where we tend to have a bigger problem here in Minnesota is with high efficiency furnaces, um, particularly because people, when they leave for the winter and leave their furnace on, that can be a slow trickle of water that can cause freezing issues. So that's one to consider. No roof runoff, no leaking clean water. You know, anything else that hasn't been contaminated by us, our clothing, our food. So I commonly get questions about water softeners, and we've talked about them several times. What I can tell you is the, the smallest amount of chloride and salt that goes out to your septic system, the better. It's better for our septic system, and it's better for the environment. So what we recommend is if you have old units, and the old units, again, generally had dials. They were set to regenerate maybe every couple days. The new ones actually regenerate based on usage. So it's also, if you get a new water softener, or if you have an existing one, the question is, is it set appropriately? So it should be set based on your hardness, and they should be serviced every five years at maximum, having someone come in and make sure it's working properly. If possible, it's also a good idea, not necessarily a requirement, but a good idea to run it out of your septic system. So instead of that backwash water, which is that salty brine running into your septic system, it could go into a separate drain field or rock pit. It can actually run to the surface, not right over your well, but the problem is that's going to run every three, four days, and so in the middle of winter that can cause issues, and because it's salty, it could kill the vegetation. Um, if you're considering an iron filter, iron filters are often put in pre-water uh, softener. If you have lots of iron in your water, these should be really diverted out of septic systems because they actually make an iron particulate or an iron solid. If that's not an option, you're very likely going to need to pump your septic tank more frequently. 
And if you have a reverse osmosis, osmosis system, most of those are just under the sink and they're not really an issue as far as the amount of backwash water. But there are some in um, home reverse osmosis systems. Those are commonly put in when people have a contamination issue with their water. So every gallon of water and for every gallon of clean water being created, they can create two or three or four gallons of wastewater. Our septic system couldn't handle that sort of volume. It would need to go somewhere else. So Nick mentioned the septic system owner's guide. I would definitely encourage you next time you're close to the county office to swing, swing in and pick one up. Uh, it has a lot more information about everything we talked about tonight. It's also great bedtime reading, possibly. So kind of in summary, what can you do to help protect our waters? The first thing is just to remember how connected all of our water is. I mean, I've had numerous conversations with property owners who basically is like, you know, what happens on my property, I'm not hurting anybody else. The problem is, is as I mentioned, our groundwater is connected, our surface water flows off our properties, so we have to be protecting our water for our future generations. So what you can do is to think about how you use water and conserve when possible. Um, properly operate and maintain your septic system and your well. If you have unused pharmaceuticals or hazardous waste, make sure you're properly disposing of those. And you guys are already doing this last one, right, which is being informed and getting involved. But I encourage you to take this message from tonight and the next time you get to talk to your neighbors or go out for coffee when we're back in a more normal world is to just talk about this message overall is, you know, we, we need more people to understand the connection because as I kind of started this, I really do believe that most Minnesotans really do care about water, but sometimes they don't see the connection between some of these activities we've talked about tonight and the environment. So there's lots of resources we've talked about. I think two best ones are the ones there on your left. So um, the Department of Health has great resources. We do as well at the university. EPA has a lot more detailed information about CECs, if that's something you're interested about. But the Department of Health also has um, information on their website about the CEC program here in Minnesota. So the last thing is these well testing kits. This was a lot easier when we met in person because we literally could hand each of you one as we were leaving. And the first time we did one of these virtually, the question is, well, could we somehow do this virtually? And the answer is kind of, right? There's still no virtual way to send water over the computer. So um, you can get a kit mailed out to you, but um, the grant that we have for this project is expiring at the end of this year. So we don't have much time because of the scheduling of this. So what they will do is they will mail you out a test kit for nitrate, coliform, and arsenic. Do keep in mind the coliform data is only accurate if it gets to the lab the same day the sample is collected. And we'll talk about your options to return it. So the following instructions, or sorry, included in the package is all of the instructions that Jeff went over about how to collect the sample. So you then have three options. One would be to ship it. If you ship it, you will not meet uh, the one day. You could bring it to one of the labs or you could bring it to one of your distribution centers. And number two and three, those options will be included in your kit. So if you'd like one of these, and again, you're gonna to wanna to write this down and I'll leave this slide up because this is the last slide. Um, you're gonna to wanna to send an email to Tracy. Tracy Borash, and the lab is R-M-B-E-L. So it's not actually the Department of Health, it's a private lab. Um, and they will actually email you result, your results back. And they also do indicate if those levels are safe. They give you some guidance about that. If for some reason you absolutely don't email, you can also call Tracy at that phone number. So you need to contact the lab this week to request the kit, and then you need to get it back in the mail if you're mailing it, or to the lab by the end of next, that following week. So that's the following Friday. So that is the prepared information we have. My last slide does have both my and Jeff's email, but I'm gonna leave this one up for a little longer just so you guys can write down that information. The other thing I'd like to really request of you is for every quick kit that's mailed out, the project is charged. So I would greatly appreciate it if you request the kit that you send it back. So we, we just, we, we've had kind of variable return of those. 
And so we just, and we really want people to get their well tested. That's the number one reason why we added this to this project was to get more people um, testing and knowing the quality of their water. So please take advantage of it. It's 100% free aside from somehow getting that sample, right? If you're going to take it to a lab, you would have a little cost there in driving, but otherwise it's totally free. So now is your opportunity to type any questions you'd like into that chat box, or I'll hand it over to you, Nick, too, if you um, also want to do the door prizes now, or we can handle questions if people want to unmute themselves. Those all are great options to me. Um, I think now would be a good time for questions. I can do the prize drawing later. They've been kind of quiet, so I haven't had a question yet. And I'll tell you, I think Jeff will agree with me. We haven't done one of these where we haven't had questions. So somebody's got to have a question. Okay, so I've got an old farmhouse with a well pit. If at some point in time I sell it, do I need to have a new well drilled or are there any rules or regulations around that matter? Uh, no, we don't uh, regulate wells at the time of property transfers. So we don't require even a well inspection or even a water quality test. We do recommend it, that you get your well, well tested. And that's typically, we recommend that to the buyer because that's just kind of a, to protect them from any future issues that they might have. Um, so no, you can, um, doesn't matter if the well complies or not, you sure can sell your property. Um, the one thing when you do construct a new well, it will have to meet new, the current code. So you couldn't put a new well in a pit again. Okay. Um, does the same thing apply to septic systems or are they regulated differently? Yeah, it's definitely different. And Nick, um, can you, I don't, do you guys have property transfer requirements? No, Redwood County does not have the property transfer requirement. So you can sell your property without having to get your well or your, sorry, your septic system um, inspected. Uh, we find that some of the banks with their financing do. Yeah, I was going to say it's very common with lenders uh, that it is required. So if you go to sell your property without the septic system being evaluated, you can often run into problems when it's time to actually go through with the sale. So it, if you know the septic system isn't up to code, you do have to disclose that. So there is a statewide requirement for septic system disclosure. And part of that is anything you know about the status of the system. Um, and I would also say more and more buyers are requesting inspections because it's whether the lender or the buyer thinks it's a, it's a potential liability, right? Because getting a new one put in can be costly. So, um, yeah. But it's not a statewide requirement. I think we're at about two thirds of the counties currently do require it somewhere in that percentage. That's why I have a requirement in Redwood. Yeah, I'd like to say that about the well too. Sometimes the banks or the lending institutions do require an inspection and then I never hear exactly what the outcome is, but uh, they may require an upgrade. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions people have? Okay, We're so getting off easy tonight, Jeff. Yep. <laughs> white vinegar is a toilet cleaner? Hot white vinegar. Hot white vinegar. So yeah, I've actually used it. I've used it for like even like concrete outside my house. Like we had concrete spray <laughs> on our siding <clears throat> that I was having trouble getting off and I used white hot vinegar and it worked. So, yeah. So on the toilet, what do you do? Just pour in a cup of hot white vinegar and swish it around or? Yeah, what I would try, and I used to do this at my old house, I don't have this problem in my new house, is I would drain the bowl as much as possible. So if you put, if you literally take like a screwdriver or usually a knife I'd put in there and hold the bowl up so it won't refill. 
because the problem is if it's full of water, it's a, it's a lot harder. Like you're going to get the best, um, it's going to work the best if you don't, if it's not mixing with the water because that's diluting it. So does that make sense? Like get as little water in the bowl and then literally spray it on there. That's what I've done and use the brush. Uh, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. I Spraying it so you just put it in a any old spray bottle and spray it in there? Yeah, it's just vinegar, right? I mean, it's, there's no harm in it, so yep. Okay, <clears throat> I'll try it this weekend. There's a question in the chat about the nearest testing lab. I know um, RMB's main lab is in Detroit Lakes. I'm not sure if they have satellite labs throughout the state. Do you know more anything? Yeah, about that, I do believe I do believe they do, but I don't actually. I mean, I can probably look it up quick here online.